Good afternoon in New York and in Chicago. Good evening in Budapest. Good night in, your, in Europe, Syria and Turkey. And welcome whatever time of day or night it is for those joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining our webinar today. This International Center for Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma will reflect on legacies of traumatic ruptures and resilience experienced by generations of Aleppo. Representing three differing Aleppo populations, panelists will discuss how the arts and other multidisciplinary initiatives from at least two continents attempt at repairing their beloved city of origin that has been ruptured and wounded time and again by both human-made and natural disasters. Those of you who took the time to watch Kevok Murad's short animation for Acts for Syria ahead of the webinar, know that it is a profound, exquisitely beautiful voyage through centuries of Syrian multiculturality, the country's ongoing traumata, while also celebrating the hope and resilience of the Syrian people. The project won the 2016 Robert Bosch Stiftung Film Prize for international cooperation between filmmakers from Germany and the Arab world in the animation category. Your moderator, that's me. I'm a clinical psychologist, victimologist, and traumatologist who devoted much of my career for studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma, to victims' rights, and to reparative justice. Kevark Murad is an Armenian artist from Syria whose animated and live visuals have been performed in venues around the world, including Korea National Opera, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the United Nations yesterday, the Elb Philharmonie, the MUCEM, Lincoln Center, and the Spoleto Festival. A member of the Silk Road Ensemble for two decades, he is featured in the documentary, The Music of Strangers. His film, Four Acts for Syria, has been shown in festivals around the world. He is represented by Galerie Tanit, Beirut, and Studio La Città in Verona. Kevork is a member of the ICMGLT's Advisory Council. Because of Lena's intergenerational obligation, she will tell you if she wants, we had to change today's previously announced sequence of speakers. Our second speaker then is Lena Sergei Attar, a founder and CEO of Karam Foundation. Lena was named one of Good Magazine 2016 Good 100 for Karam's innovative work with Syrian refugees. A Syrian American architect and writer from Aleppo, her articles and essays have been published in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Foreign Policy, Politico, The Atlantis, and BBC. She has appeared about the Syrian humanitarian crisis on media outlets such as CNN, NBC News, BBC News, Huffington Post, NPR, and spoken among others at RISD, Harvard University of, University of Chicago, John Hopkins 
Northwestern, the New School Phillips Exeter Academy, King's Academy, the Chicago Council of Global Affairs, New America, and the Aspen Institute. A co-founder of the How Many More project, Lena serves as chair of the board of directors of the Syria campaign and is a non-resident fellow at New America. Last but not least, a new parent, Al-Hakam Shah, is a linguist and urban sociologist, a researcher at the Aleppo project. He contributes to preserving Aleppian culture heritage Facebook groups is part of the Modern Endangered Archive program, Archives program of UCLA. Holding a master's degree in applied linguistics and in sociology and social anthropology, Al-Hakam's thesis used ethnographic methods to study placemaking by Aleppian migrants and refugees in Berlin. Al-Hakam aims at contributing to documenting Aleppo's linguistic heritage. The registrants to today's webinars from over 10 countries attest both to the timely urgency of this event and to the symbolism, magic, and nostalgic power of Aleppo. This webinar would not have happened if it weren't for the networking magic, professionalism, and generosity of Kevog Murad, who is the ICMGLT, who the ICMGLT is proud to have as both a member of our advisory council and of its working group on the arts. We have an hour and a half for the webinar. Each speaker will, will talk for about 10 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free, feel free to direct your questions to a particular panelist or to the full panel. I now give the screen floor to Kevork Murad. Kevork, please. Hello, dear Daniel uh, and fellow amazing friends. This is such an honor to share personal and professional journey with everyone. And um, I'm a bit emotional because my colleagues here, they're directly from Aleppo. And, you know, anytime I think and I hear about Aleppo, kind of, it's, it's, I run out of words to express how incredible that culture, that community was for me. So to start, I'm just going to say briefly about uh, the journey that my ancestor did, which had a huge impact on me personally and my career. My uh, maternal grandfather arrived to Syria uh, just after the Armenian genocide uh, that happened by the Turks. They arrived to Syria finding a safe haven and they settled just on the border between Syria and Turkey in a small town called Kamishli, which was uh, which still mainly populated by Kurdish people. They arrived orphaned, two brothers, and quickly he learned Kurdish and adopted the Kurdish language to compose music that he wrote in Kurdish language. And he celebrated the diversity of the region with playing in weddings and acting like a troubadour. In the meantime, he was a deacon. So that act impacted on my career in a way that I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be this troubadour capturing the voices of the indigenous people and figure out how I can create this tapestry, which is very unique because when you live in a region like that, you think the entire world is like that, but it's not. Once you come to the West, you realize it's all dissected. People are living in their cocoons, but 
early on, I started figuring out how to uh, draw inspired by music like him and went from Syria, Aleppo, to uh, Armenia to study art. And I wanted to become an illustrator. So I studied bookmaking and illustration. And very quickly, I said, I want to illustrate sound. So that became kind of my concentration to illustrate whatever I hear could be live music or pre-recorded stuff. And always thinking about my grandfather, how he was kind of collecting and documenting what was happening in the region. So after I graduated uh, my art school in Armenia, I was so fortunate, I've uh, been invited by Jill Hoffman. I think she is, she is hearing us here. Hi, Jill. Uh, it's so moving to see someone like her kind of shaped and changed my career. She invited me with her own expense to this country, believing in my work. And she said, you know, one day you're going to give back. And yes, I'm ready to give back not only to her and to the entire community. That's how I met Lina, and that's how I meet uh, so many creative people and traveling back to, to uh, uh, Syrian refugee camps in Jordan or in Lebanon. And I feel like what Jill did, it kind of planted the act of giving back, how to give back. So uh, in my career, I have these two art forms. One as uh, our dear Danielle, she, uh, mentioned that I kind of capture and do live drawing and animation on stage. And I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Yo-Yo Ma uh, in 2004. And as soon as I became American citizen, 2005, he said, you're going to uh, Japan to perform with the Silk Road. That's how my career shaped just because of him. And I'm forever thankful to Yo-Yo Ma and people like him who support the immigrant people like us. And the other part of career is creating, drawing, and capturing, for me, Syria. Capturing what's there, what's left, and what's gone. I feel like through my work, I try to document whatever it was in Aleppo, sound and shapes and architecture, smells and food and tapestries. And I feel like whatever I do, like for example, this piece, this cutout, it's like a tapestry woven between so many voices and cultures. So that's basically the summary of uh, my work. And I'm sure later on, people are going to ask questions and I'm here to, to answer. Thank you. <laughs> you could say a lot more, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to say more, yes. Uh, Elena, uh, please. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Yael. First, I wanted to thank you for inviting me to this important and special occasion to speak about my home, Aleppo, with these two Aleppo experts, Kivork and Al Hakam. And I thank everyone for tuning in today to listen to our Syrian stories. My name is Lina Sergi Attar, and I am the CEO of Karam Foundation. Karam means generosity in Arabic, and I'll be speaking today about my home, Syria, about Aleppo and also about the work that we do for the future of Syria and of Aleppo. And I wanted to start by acknowledging that today marks the 12th anniversary of the Syrian revolution for freedom and dignity. March 15 is a very important day for, the, for Syrian history. 12 years ago, thousands of people took to the streets to demand their, to demand their human rights for freedom and dignity. And when today, when people think about Syria, it's very painful to know that most people around the world, when they think about Syria, they think about war, about destruction, about mass displacement, and people forget about the peaceful, creative, and courageous acts of resistance that so many Syrian citizens participated in. And these acts were met with oppression, terror, and mass violence from the regime and its allies that left a country of over 24 million people scarred by the trauma of the last decade. Over 12 million people in Syria have lost their homes. So many forcefully displaced many times, the latest from this earthquake tragedy that has happened just last month. And this has been internal and external displacement since 2011, over half of the pre-war population. And I know that the word Syrian so often automatically is attached to the word refugee, but I'd like to reflect today 
for everybody to just think about the fact that 12 years ago today, there were zero Syrian refugees. Let's pause for a moment to remember the hundreds of thousands of Syrians who've lost their lives in the last 12 years in every way imaginable, and the millions more who've been displaced, all in pursuit of a better life for themselves and their families. Today's, I'm gonna to share a few slides. Um, this is the hardest part always about the presentations. Here it is. It's... <laughs> Here we go. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to share a few slides about my Aleppo. This is Aleppo, and you can see it in also in my background. Uh, it's it's a... no, sweetie, it's loading. Is it okay? Uh, Do you see it now? Take your time. Aleppo uh, is always work in progress. Aleppo is always loading. <laughs> yes. It's loading. Let it, it load. Okay. It, it's all right. You don't need to rush. No uh, problem. I can because I can see the slide, so I can't see what you see. <laughs> Maybe we try taking it off a slideshow. Uh, Is this? Can yeah. you see this? Yeah, yeah, that looks good. Yeah, good. Okay, good, 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 good. I'll just do oh, this. No, I said good, and here we are. Okay, here we go. So this is my city of Aleppo, the city of stone and minarets. Unfortunately, when we think about Aleppo today, it's a scene of destruction and trauma, not of the beauty and the culture that Kivork spoke about and the memories that we all have of our beloved Syria and Aleppo. And I wanted to mention um, Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor um, and the, the writer of Man's Search for Meeting gave us an, an incredible tool for processing trauma and hardship. Between stimulus and response, there's a space, and in that space lies our freedom and our choice to respond. And so I wanted to talk today about that space that we exist in between the past and, and the future, and between what we can respond to, what can you respond to, to this mass trauma that millions of people have experienced, and how do we actually create hope for the future? So this is the only photo of destruction I'll show today and the rest are all going to be about that between that past and the future that we aspire to. This is an image of Aleppo from the top of the citadel that I took long ago when I was a student of architecture at the University of Aleppo and it shows the vibrancy of the city old and new all of the things that we loved about the city that is ancient in history and always living and and developing um, throughout the centuries. This is an image of my grandmother's building in the Sabil and her famous balcony that we would connect with growing up with my cousins and my aunts, a place of a lot of love and nourishing that we had over the years. And this is an image of the inside of one of my grandmother's vitrines in her house, those glass vitrines where she would collect all of the objects that were important to her between antiques that she had from her family to wedding mementos, to pieces of silver, to pictures of her grandchildren and all of the things that we hold dear to ourselves, these objects that really make the meaning of our lives. And this is an image of myself and my daughters in front of the Citadel of Aleppo that you saw when I took from the top as a student coming back every summer with my daughters, Alia and Rayan, um, in front in the last time that they were in Aleppo in 2010. Aleppo is always part of our background, the architecture, the culture, the language, the food, the family, everything, all of the beautiful parts of Aleppo have always been part of our DNA as people from Aleppo. And so the, I mean, I went through these different scales of Aleppo from city to building to neighborhood to actual inside our homes to our own family photos and memories as this way of like this idea of mapping the city at different scales of intimacy from far away, like this map, this tourist map of Aleppo that is very removed um, from, from the inner city to maps that I used to collect back in 2000 when I was also a student of architecture from my own families, drawing their own maps of different parts of the city and remembering different layers of their history throughout their experience of the city. So this is actually um, one of my relatives maps talking about the different things that had been lost in the city, including old tramways, a river that dried up, 
and all of the different pieces of um, landmarks in a city that orient you that I've lost throughout the years. And here's another example of that. I continued this idea of mapping even after losing uh, my home, after my whole entire family had to leave Syria, like millions of other Syrians who had to leave Aleppo. And I would draw memories of my city and maps of my own home and put down the memories of living in my home in Syria and in Aleppo and trying to collect all of that for my own daughters and my future family. And at Karam, we used to do these um, exercises with Syrian refugee camps at the beginning of the, um, the, the humanitarian crisis and now continuing on at our Karam houses in Turkey that I'll talk about. And in these, I used to draw a map of Aleppo, which you can see in the background and encourage young Syrian refugees to draw their maps of home, whether that was in the past or the future or the present. And I would encourage them to think about their cities and their homes as places of things that you can map your memories onto and you can even imagine futures. So I used to mix between this idea of remembering and imagining. And that is again, that space of in between to try to heal from that trauma and try to bridge between the past and the future. And these are examples of children that would be mapping their future homes. And they would draw their homes and draw their, their maps. And then they would stand in front of the class and tell the stories of these future places that they want to belong to and be part of. This is a very meaningful exercise for young children and for teenagers to actually ignite this idea of imagining a, a, a better future and a, and a more beautiful place for themselves. And so I want to share here a moment that happened actually last year when I was in Istanbul. We have two Karam houses. These are innovation spaces for Syrian refugee teenagers. And this is our house in Istanbul. And something really meaningful happened to me because a lot of times when I speak with children about Syria, my own children and the ch Syrian refugees I work with, I always, re as the longer the time has passed between being displaced from your home and not being there, I recognize that I'm speaking about Ale an Aleppo that no longer exists for these children. They never even experienced it. And I'm telling them a story about a place that for me, even this don't no, no longer exists. There is that gap of time. And so this was a very surprising moment for me. I met this young man named Adam and he is 16 years old in, in um, Istanbul and he was six years old when he left Aleppo and he was telling me about how he wants to be a doctor he wants to be specifically a cardiologist because his father um, has heart disease and he wants to be able to treat his own father he walks around with a biology book in Arabic in his bag because he wants to understand biology in both Turkish and in Arabic so that he can be a doctor practicing doctor in Syria in the future but what surprised me the most is that I, he, he told me I'm from Aleppo and I asked him where in Aleppo and he took out his phone. This is Dimitri, who is part of our team. He took out his phone and he started opening the Google map of Aleppo and zoomed in more and more and more and more and more until he went to tort next to the citadel and right in a neighborhood near the citadel until he pinpointed his exact home where he grew up in Aleppo until he was six years old and telling us, this is where I lived. This is where the bombs fell. This is where we had to flee and there was nothing left of our building when we left, but this is where I'm from. And, I, and, and it, was, it was this really uh, powerful moment for me to see one of the children, you know, if we recognize those images from 2011 of the protests and people running with their children on their, on their shoulders during the early days of the revolution, he is one of those children that we would see growing up now in Turkey um, with a future in his on his mind and working towards that future, but still very much grounded in this memory of this place, this point on the map is where I'm from. And I found that to be hugely inspiring. This is a woman named Batul, and she is now in university. 
And she's also one of our students at Karam House Rehandle, which is right on the border with Syria and one of the areas that was impacted by the earthquake. And she, here you can read what she said, Batul wants to be an astronaut. She's now studying science, science in university in Aleppo, in, in Turkey. And she's originally from Aleppo. And she talks a lot about remembering this place that she ran away from, had to leave, and that she now wants to study and become a part of the future and be part of rebuilding it. So this idea of rebuilding after trauma, restoring after trauma is something that lives within the young people that we, um, that we work with and that we invest in and that future of Syria that exists in people versus in the actual place and the buildings that have been displaced. And so I want to end just by showing you some portraits of these young people that we work with every day at Karam Foundation, because it changes the fact of how all of the images of Syrian refugees we've seen over the years, people that live with a lot, uh, that don't show people in their full dignity, in their full pride, and in their full potential. These are the young Syrians that we want to become the future leaders of Syria, both inside Syria and outside. And so here are some images of these young people in all their potential and all they can be, they aspire to be. And they make things every day, they create things and, and they are the people that we, um, we, we invest in. And lastly, I want to show that when we talk about home and talk about where we're from, Karam House is a place where a lot of young children belong to because they've learned that this is a safe place for them to come, to be together as a community, to build things together and to learn together. And this is what we've tried to instill with them in this home outside of their homeland. And so we gave the kids a, a like an exercise to say, what does Karam House mean to you? And for me, this is the one of the most moving ones, little post-its that somebody wrote saying, that Karam House is everything. And so this is kind of what we want to continue to create, even though we're not in Aleppo, to kind of continue that nurturing, cultural, um, creative space, uh, this place of love and belonging that I knew in my grandmother's house that Kivork speaks about, that I'm sure Al-Hakam will speak about as well, that we actually can cultivate that anywhere. And this is where what I learned, my biggest lesson from the kids is that one of the most painful parts of losing home is be constantly being stuck in that past. And what these kids teach me every day and teach our whole entire team is that home is not only where you're from, home is where you're going to home is actually always something that we're making and we're taking with us into a future. So it's both things together that creates that sense of healing from the trauma that we've experienced. And we all hope that one day we will go back to Aleppo, but in the meantime, we're con constantly building our Aleppo in our own ways, in these people that we actually tell people Ale about Aleppo and continue on into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, for, for a, a most moving presentation and for being such a good psychologist on top of being a, <laughs> all your other qualifications. Uh, you remind me of uh, a very important uh, conference that was held, uh, held at Oxford University many years ago uh, about the Holocaust. And, the name was Remembering for the Future. So uh, that's really powerful. Uh, yeah, very powerful. And it's very much speaking to, about the space that you, you adopted uh, rightly from uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, of course, uh, the Jewish people, when they pray every day, they say, they in the diaspora always said, if I forget Jerusalem, I lose my hand, my right arm and my being. So so what you're describing is is the longing and 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 but the, the longing from the past to the future, uh, yet uh, the meaning of home. Uh, and in fact, the other thing that we share, which is uh, the learning that whatever we carry inside us, nobody can take away. 
Uh, I remember talk, speaking about that in Rwanda right after the genocide when I spoke to orphans and, and, and um, so these are tragic lessons we learn from Absolutely. that we don't want to know, but, but we all somehow uh, share the depth of, of these lessons. And what's interesting also is um, some of you in the audience know uh, my own, in my own descriptions of survivors, what I call the post post trauma adaptational styles, and uh, Kevork knows some of it too. Uh, I describe the victim style, the fighter style, the numb style, the don't, those who made it. And what's interesting is you're saying that, and again, rightly so, that in some ways, part of your satisfaction with the Karam, with the work of Karam, uh, is to see that people avoid being stuck. That, part, that you understand that you don't want the sense of loyalty to be a sense of being stuck. You want it to transform. Uh, yes. So uh, this is extremely important. And again, another lesson we will work on together, <laughs> I'm sure. Yes, in absolutely. The um, so thank you for both for your totally inspiring. Uh, <laughs> totally. And, and now, Lena, I'm taking, helping you take care of your daughter. You have to get off for 15 minutes at 1.45, right? Yes, I'll be, I'll be going off right now and I'll be back in about 15 minutes. Oh, okay. So you will, you will, I feel bad for you because you will miss an outcome uh, uh, presentation, but you will uh, gain from listening to your daughter. As I said, it is a, an intergenerational obligation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll have come. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yael uh, and Kevork and Lena. I feel uh, set up. Uh, this is a trap uh, you have set for me to speak right <laughs> after the beautiful uh, contributions uh, from Kevork and Lena and yourself, Dr. Yael. Very interesting uh, commentary. Um, and uh, I wasn't planning to speak much about my own background, but um, I believe uh, you did right doing that, uh, especially as a soci uh, sociologist myself, I should recognize the importance of uh, doing a bit of positionality uh, mm -hmm. uh, to do a bit of uh, annoying uh, woke uh, stuff uh, that some people uh, uh, that that's going around. But uh, this is very important. For instance, I will start by saying where I stand. I'm someone from Syria. I'm someone who's uh, from Aleppo, who's lost uh, a very dear home. Uh, due to conflict and uh, uh, earthquake uh, uh, compounding the problem uh, further. Uh, but I am two steps removed from uh, this very, um, or from the changes that are happening. I'm removed from what's happened with the earthquake because I am away, I am not home and uh, continuing to uh, suffer. And uh, uh, my direct family are also away. Uh, so I'm whatever I go through is really not the same as what someone who is still inside Aleppo or who is in a refugee in so southern Turkey uh, uh, goes through. Uh, that said, uh, I still have uh, uh, my only family property there, my only personal property there, only uh, home, uh, more important than that. My only citizenship, I'm still a citizen of nothing except Syria, and I go renew my Syrian passport every two years uh, because I haven't done my military service uh, to the Syrian regime, which obviously I have my reasons to refuse to do. That means uh, as a male who hasn't done that, uh, my passport goes only two years and I have to pay uh, something around 300 euros every two years, uh, which I unfortunately continue to do, but I would like to one day not uh, have to. Um, I'm, uh, I also still have family, I still have friends, I still have neighbors who have been impacted. Uh, and uh, most recently with the earthquake that's happened, 
um, on top of the damage that's happened to our uh, fam my family house in old Aleppo and uh, our uh, neighbors uh, as well, both of which were destroyed by barrel bombs uh, in 2016 towards the end of uh, the Syrian regime's campaign to recapture Aleppo. Um, uh, my neighbors who were taking care of our house were now in Antakya and now they had to be displaced a second time uh, uh their home totally collapsed one of their sons actually had branched out into a different home and he was very lucky to have a newborn uh, uh that his mom uh, told him it's so cold too cold for you to stay uh, with the newborn come with your wife and newborn and stay with me his home is to the ground to the floor luckily he's not uh, out there uh, and now they have to deal with problems that i personally don't have to deal with looking for um a place in Ankara uh, where the, the, the circle is going wider and wider because you cannot find anything in Antakya, Ghazi, Antep, Adana, uh, Marash. Yeah, people are going as far as Ant uh, Ankara and uh, they're having to pay like a three months deposit in advance, people who have really no means uh, uh, to do that. Um, uh, Anyway, this is not a talk about uh, only suffering, and uh, the, there is more to us, all of us. Uh, there is uh, a home, there is connection, there is hope, there is future. Uh, but a bit more about uh, uh, myself. I'm, um, I'm very lucky still, despite all that's happened, to call uh, Old Aleppo my home. Um, when I was uh, nine uh, years old, my uh, father, due to financial reasons, he was a general in the Syrian army, and his salary was about $300 a month, and he had seven children uh, to raise. And uh, uh, he had to sell our flat in the socialist neighborhood in Western Aleppo called Al Hamdaniye. I know one of the people listening in to us is Zaido Zaido. He is uh, a, a, a scholar uh, of architecture in old Aleppo, and he'd be oh. tingling to hear these details. Yeah, so uh, we we left that place where, uh, ironically, older Aleppo, historical and majestic as it is, it was cheaper to live in. Uh, but for my father, it was beyond that. It was the love of heritage that uh, um, he was born in an old house. We call it Arabic house in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really just wanted to, uh, here it is, uh, here it is. Uh, he, he really just wanted to go back to that. He wanted to go back to a place that he said, where he says, "You own, you own the land and you own the sky." He wanted this freedom. Perhaps it's the outer oppression in in going around the streets uh, in not just Aleppo, all around Syria, uh, but the political situation that you're in, the financial uh, oppressions. Uh, you want this kind of safe haven of yours, and our old house in Qadi Askar in old Aleppo became that safe haven. So from nine years old, I would go with my father and my younger brother, also called Karam, uh, and uh, we would help my father. Um, again, he wanted to engage us, but also he wanted to save money. So it's like, yalla ya hakam, yalla ya karam, go dig me a, a little drain here in the, in, the, in the bathroom. I'll give you 10... 10, what would, would be equal to $10 cents, you know, uh, as a con, um, uh, reward. By that, he saved uh, like uh, $5 actually from bringing an actual plumber to do the drain. Uh, but really, th this is the place that I, you know, did some grouting of uh, on the walls. I uh, mixed cement uh, for some of the reconstruction that we did. And uh, uh, now is, is uh, sadly in a uh, bad state. And that tied me in to Aleppo in my uh, uh, further studies. And uh, it has been my focus uh, professionally since uh, 2015. Uh, for six years, I worked uh, as part of something called the Aleppo Project uh, that was based out of, um, out of Central European University. By the way, it's a university that's registered in the New York, um, yeah, New York State Universities. And uh, it was based in Budapest at the time, now moved to Vienna because some other authoritarian regime kicked that liberal university out of the city. Uh, but I was lucky to live in Budapest for six years and work, work as part of this project where, which became a platform for bringing together uh, preserving old knowledge and we did it in various ways all the ways you could imagine and uh, I also know with us is uh, Madiha Merchant kudos to you if you're um, if you're hearing me Madiha Madiha uh, was uh, she, she has a PhD in urban planning from uh, Columbia University I believe and she's still a scholar and she was one of those who contributed and uh, uh, did her own part of the Aleppo project 
uh, based out of New York. Um, and uh, so we've, we've done with Madiha, for instance, a lot of mapping. Uh, uh, it was mostly her work, actually, the mapping bit. Uh, but we've blogged, we've invited people to uh, blog for us um, and uh, I mean, for themselves, for everybody, for Aleppo. Uh, but we were th this website, uh, the Aleppo project became kind of a reservoir uh, for all this contribution. Uh, we would translate things into languages. If someone wrote in English with an Arabic and vice versa, uh, we would go scouting for information for like um, heartfelt uh, in 20 2016, when uh, people were being, uh, you know, kicked out of their homes uh, in Aleppo uh, as the regime was advancing, there was a, a population eviction. Everybody eventually, whoever managed to survive four and a half years of barrel bombs, they were um, eventually uh, pushed out, put in something called the green buses, actual green buses that would line up at, at the end of every conquest by the Syrian regime and everybody would go out as a part of a deal to save the lives of those remaining. Mm -hmm. And uh, people in that situation were blogging, but they're on their own Facebook and Twitter accounts, for instance, and they were in no mood to come and uh, tailor make uh, some contribution for us. So we would go and like take it and translate it and put it up on the website. And uh, uh, But more on th than that, we've, we've done policy research. Uh, so there are loads of policy papers. So surveys with thousands of Aleppians uh, on how they saw Aleppo, their experiences with the war, and how they envision it for the future. Um, unfortunately, I left the university in 2020, uh, and uh, the Aleppo project is now in a kind of semi-dormant phase where it needs some um, uh, reviving. Maybe uh, we will energize it together. Uh -huh. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. At the, in, the mean, in the meantime, I decided I need something that guarantees my own uh, financial security. So I started to study programming, where is my book, uh, Python, uh, programming language. But that's specifically because of um, the importance of, I started about two years ago, and now we're seeing how important these uh, language models that are appearing, AI language models, this chat GPT and all of that. And uh, this is all... Um, the machine's way, of course, there are programmers behind it, of uh, making sense of language and posing as a, in, an interlocutor with us. But what's being left behind is uh, the di little dialects, uh, as, uh, the way an Aleppian would speak, um, and all of that and it should be preserved. There has been a lot of work done, uh, and now I'm working more on that. We have something very famous, beautiful, called the Aleppo Encyclo uh, the Comparative Encyclopedia of Aleppo, seven volumes it's encyclopedia but it's a dictionary uh, we have our own dr johnson of the Aleppian okay, dialect can you, put, can you put the link on the chat after uh, after your presentation so people uh, can access it absolutely absolutely I will, I will. we can also uh, we can also list it in the in the center's library yes please that please. would be fantastic wonderful yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So this encyclopedia or dictionary of the Aleppo talk uh, was completed by 1971, published a decade after the death of uh, the author. And with my father in 2010, uh, with a Syrian civil society in Aleppo, we digitized it. Uh, but further work uh, uh, needs to be done. Actually, we've lost the original digitized uh, bits. So now we need to redigitize what is digital. Now we have PDF files that are searchable. Uh, um, and it's text that you can copy and paste. It's not an image, uh, but we don't have the word files. <laughs> I have a lot of them, but they are not the you know the latest draft. That means we have to rework from uh, earlier drafts, and we have to we have to work with a, a specially created Aleppo font. So any all of that um, uh, for me, it's really about preserving. Uh, uh, the way people express themselves, the, the way our grandparents and parents express uh, themselves, the way we now express ourselves, and especially with the, uh, uh, now, as Lina mentioned, a lot of the new generations never having uh, seen their homes or remembering what actually their homes are, and they really want to learn more. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot that can be done on that. And uh, I will conclude with uh, one final uh, uh, here someone posted, uh, this could be, um, no, that's something else, sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> we, have a very, we always have a very active audience at the center. Excellent. That's why we are center. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, I will conclude by um, talking about um, 
Thank you very much, Zaido. Uh, by talking about um, a current project that I'm a part of uh, with uh, Kristen Parker, who actually put me in touch with Kevork in the play first place from Boston. And um, she's a principal investigator in this project that I am co-researching on uh, preserving Aleppo uh, Facebook groups. Uh, that's the one that's based uh, 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 or uh, supported by UCLA. And uh, uh, we're working on, uh, at the moment, preserving one uh, we have got, we have pulled together, uh, pulled out, extracted the whole archives of one Facebook group called um, uh, the the Encyclopedia of uh, Aleppo Proverbs, and uh, and we're working to understand what these Facebook groups mean to people, why they are, why they feel motivated to go there, and um, hopefully you shall see some results uh, uh, soon published. And I will conclude with that. I'm sure, I'm sure there's more you want to say too, but we have the time and and uh, I hope Lena joins us back soon because it occurred to me that you can probably recruit some of her, her, the kids in Karen mm -hmm. uh, for, to help you <laughs> to help you to digitize. I would be very very lucky. <laughs> This yeah. is part of what we do, that together. <laughs> Thank you very together. much, Dr. Yael. <laughs> get yes. together to help everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you do know, or let me inform you, that uh, one of the things that the center does is give the repairer awards twice a year one time during the month of my birthday and one time during the month which is march <laughs> and one time during october which is the center's birthday uh, uh, and and that is why we call it repairer awards because we believe that all of the initiatives as you can hear our speakers all of the initiatives you can speak uh, you are listening to and, and viewing and hearing um, our repairs, right? We, we, we repair, uh, which is exactly remembering for the future. You know, we put together what was, we, the repair is also to put together what was destroyed. So in some ways it's, symbolically to undo some of the destruction, right? And the creativity is what energizes, what energizes it. Uh, I hope Lena joins us, but uh, soon, I think this is the time she said she'll be back, but we don't have to wait for her knowing uh, Kevork. He has a lot more to say and Kevork, uh, go ahead. <laughs> And, and now is the time for our own di dialogue. So this is quite natural. Go ahead, dear. Yeah, so uh, very inspiring talk, Al Hakam and Lina. I feel like I went back to Aleppo with every cobblestone, every corner, every door that uh, was part of my memory. Thank you. That's so vivid and incredible work that you do and Lina too. No, thank so, you, Kevor. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. So what I was going to conclude with uh, sharing uh, my work, I think it's uh, meaningful after both of you talked about the uh, place and memory and how those kind of two important things to, to grab things from your memory and capture it and share it with the Western audience. For me, it's very important. Otherwise, if we don't document it uh, in our ways, who's going to do it? You know, oh. We do our best and we'll let that happen. So now, uh, if that's okay with everyone, I want to show uh, to our audience some of my work. Uh, maybe some of you guys seen the animation, and I want to show. Um, shall I share it, or you will do it there? You know, you, you share it. You share it because you know what you want to share. Yes. Okay. So uh, okay. here is the sharing. Exactly. It's happening. Correct. Perfect. Right, and maybe you can also speak to it, so yeah. the, so the audience is with you in in your heart and soul, also yeah. in mind. 
Okay, the title is called Immortal City. It is uh, directly inspired by Aleppo. This was done in 2016. Uh, this uh, piece uh, was actually inspired by a conversation that I had with my childhood friend. He was living in Aleppo. And every time I was having a phone call with him, he was telling me that, no, I want to stay here. I'm not going to leave this city. And I thought that the reason Aleppo is Aleppo is immortal for centuries, uh, just because of people like him. They protected the city. They created this, even though you see the city is like falling apart, but people are tying themselves here for me, regardless if they're sleeping or they're dreaming, they are part of Aleppo. They are part of this immortality of the city. Here, I'm combining two things, the ropes, symbolically kind of tying with the structure. And second, something very interesting, maybe Hakam will elaborate on that later, the fabric, the tapestry. So when I was speaking with my friend, he was a pharmacist in Aleppo. He has two children, two young boys. And daily when he was going back and forth to his work, he was hiding so that the neighborhood came together and they put pitch money to hang this big fabric tapestries to hide behind, to protect themselves from snipers. It's, it's, it's like unimaginable for the Western audience, you know, to go to work while the snipers are shooting left and right. That's like insane. So here, like this, this fabric you see, it's not only protecting the structures, also protecting people kind of wrap themselves in it. And the kind of symbolically, I use the tapestries like the, the chafiye, the, the traditional kind of the scarf of the Middle Eastern use. So that's the first piece. And then if we move to the next one, is actually the piece that Kristen Parker, uh, she curated the show. That's how we became close friends because she gave me this incredible opportunity to exhibit at the Rose Art Museum. Uh, this was in 2018. This piece uh, my, is my first uh, three-dimensional piece. Uh, it's combined uh, kind of by three different layers. Uh, it symbolically refer, refers to uh, time, time, slices of time. The very far, we see the Gate of Palmyra on right, and on the left, we see Aleppo Citadel. In the middle, we see the structures are standing soundly uh, between synagogues and mosques and Armenian churches and all that. The front, we see what happened the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Yeah, uh, Carol, would you speak a little bit more since it wasn't sufficiently emphasized yet in this webinar? You're mentioning Jews, Armenians, Syrians living together. Could you expand a little more about what Aleppo was like in that, in the multicultural sense? So when I was living in Aleppo, I did not encounter many Jews. My mom was telling me about her experience with her friends and neighbors, their Jews, and they shared food and they played together when she was a kid. Uh, I created things in, in mind that I'm documenting that city, like going back in time. So this, this piece, for example, for me, it's like symbolically is 3000 years old. The, the, the far part is like old and the middle is like maybe 500 years old in, the front is recent. So the, the reason I wanted to capture this, I felt that many of the Armenians and, and, and minorities, they're leaving. Like in, in this current uh, um, immigrant crisis, kind of it, it kind of lost so many incredible minorities who were part of this fabric. So I can't speak directly about uh, the Jewish community there, but I can say that when I was, 12 years old, for example, uh, I went and I stayed with my relatives in this far, small, remote village. Uh, back then, 1982, they didn't have electricity and no phone. Uh, I realized that they were not speaking in Arabic. They were not speaking in Armenian. They were speaking Assyrian. And I was there for a month and it was so much fun to be part of that little community and learn some words. And then now when I'm creating piece like this, I have to put some room in their voices. Like, I don't know where they are. You know what I mean? The same thing, Jews. I don't know. They're not there. But we hear about them. 
when we go to uh, the, the souk, they say, oh, the, the, the Jewish quarter, for example. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like the name is still there because they, uh, so many Jewish merchants, they were uh, well known in, let's say, wool import, export, and jewelry and stuff like that. But in this specific word, work, I called it strata of memory. Basically, you're standing in front of a piece. It's, it's like a slices of memory, a slices of time, and capturing what was there. So this one, it's a memory homage to the city of Ani. Now I'm like Armenian. It's, it's all about this, uh, again, time and layers. But this was a place in medieval time flourished. It had like a thousand and hundred churches. Uh, it's very close to Diyarbakir, where, where the earthquake happened. So if you right now Google or put on uh, search Sid Ani city, you will see probably one monastery or so, but that place used to be the cultural capital, is gone. So like as an artist, for me, like, I feel like I need to rebuild, recreate for the future generations. Otherwise it's all lost. So this was back to, to you, Dr. Yael, talking about the incredible uh, wealth of cultures between Jews and Christians and Armenians. This is an interesting piece for me. I call it, Memories of the Stone, where symbolically it's about the, the golden age in Spain, where the stone is telling us thousand years later, what have we achieved? We have not achieved. We're still have this conflict between you know, many of us. So if you, I'm gonna try to- Yeah, Kevin, just a second. Uh, we are hearing some voices in the background it's uh, not Robin, from me. Can you help? Uh, you have Kevok twice here. Do you know what that's about? That's Kevok's inner voice. <laughs> it, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll put the headphone if it continues. I mean, it's reading. not only layers of time, it layers, layers of voice of also. Thank you, Alakam. <laughs> you're, you're a true poet, Alakam. You're a true poet. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevok. So it's this is not this, going on here. <laughs> um, I'm going to put it in the in the chat link. This was a piece done at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, they did something very interesting. They called um, a studio uh, as a museum or a museum as a studio. Mm -hmm. So what happened is uh, the audience were coming visiting the museum while I was creating this piece. Mm -hmm. I made this work in a uh, length of uh, 10 days. Uh, with also help uh, by students. They came, they became part of the workshop, they did the cutting, but I created, I wanted to create this kind of a, a place where it, it had so much to offer to humanities, like in, in one, uh, uh, um, let's say establishment or government, they had a different fates, part of the same uh, uh, system. So this was like a thousand years ago, as I said, you know, golden era of Spain. And now you as an audience, when you're in front of this piece, you feel embarrassed that thousand years later, we have not achieved much. So that's, that's the, the key point of this piece. And uh, again, rebuilding lost places inspired by ancient uh, places in Syria like Mari or Palmyra and all this, inventing uh, calligraphy. It's kind of inspired by Arabic calligraphy, but it's not kind of, almost like a, a flavor and memory of what was there before. This is actually at Studio La Chita, uh, back here, very much inspired by old uh, neighborhood of Aleppo, floating city, as you know, like we, all of us, when we're leaving, we're taking our memories with us to rebuild our homes. That's symbolic, like it's like, <laughs> we're all floating in the air. We're not here, we're not there. So, uh, so this is my latest piece. Uh, I call it memory gates. It symbolically brings people together. The idea is when you enter here, it does not refer to a specific place and geography. It's about person experiencing this deja vu, like they've been there regardless of their background, their ethnicity. So when they go there, they feel this common, common feeling like someone else. And that brings, connects people together. So this is, I was dreaming about creating a piece like this 
to enter in the piece, like entering the artwork, like physical work. It's not digital. It's not like a VR. So, and it's not really interesting how it connects to uh, Lena's notion of home. Yes, and it's again floating. I specifically didn't want to lean on the floor, so the whole thing is suspended. And believe it or not, this whole thing fits in half of the carry-on. I recently took this to Oslo Freedom Forum. I hung it there. So it's again, we're like immigrants just taking with us our homes, carrying it with us and, and pitching it like a tent anywhere we go. So, uh, and another reason that I created this, it was- ever, There's a question from the audience, where is it show, showing? So originally was uh, commissioned and shown at um, uh, College of Holy Cross Cantor Gallery. They were the sponsor of me making this. Uh, when they asked me to create the piece, they shared the floor plan. And I was thinking it would be meaningful for the students because everything was done online. And uh, most of the students are seeing things flat on the screen. I wanted to also to make things uh, kind of exaggerated sensation to be multi-sensory piece where the students can come and go in because they were so bored of being this flatness. So I put so many ideas in one and this piece is made in seven days and seven nights. I was symbolic. I told them I'm going to make it in seven days and seven nights, very much like a spiritual take. And as you see, again, the calligraphy is all invented. And at the very, very, very far, the door is kind of homage to my ancestors. I call it the Armenian door. It's mm -hmm. a door that at the end, when you open, you can visit your, your, your ancestors. Also reminds me of the old homes of Aleppo. I remember passing Guayal's old homes. I always <laughs> wanted to go in. And now that Al Hakam said that he and his father, they grew up in a place like this, which is so beautiful. Uh, later on, you know, late my, you know, when I was uh, in Aleppo, the like last, last couple of years, I was fortunate enough to visit one of those homes. It's called the Beta Sisi. I don't know if you, you've been there, Hakam. It's so beautiful, so beautiful. And unfortunately, it got destroyed again in the, the war and all this. So, yeah, so if there's any question, I'm here to, to, to answer. Yes. Uh, 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 Robbie, would you try to contact Lena and figure out what, what's I'm my name? She's, she's here. She's ah, here. She's here. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for coming back. Exactly, exactly on time too, because yeah. prior to, we were just making connections of Kevok's last piece with your home, right? With your ideal of creating a home, and and and, and Al Hakam's ideal of creating a linguistic home. Uh, so, so there, there's so many things to so many dimensions to discuss and so many uh that, that we can we can actually spend at least a week together uh and you know perhaps even writing a book here because uh and and with the questions and comments from the audience they're quite extraordinary so before we open to the audience it, 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 do you have uh, uh, Al-Hakam, is there anything you would like to say right now in, or, or, or Lena in, in response to, to what Kevok was talking about and then we open it to the audience and Robbie because because we there is such a good sense of camaraderie here uh, I would like the audience to be able to speak uh, rather than only write if it's okay so uh so try to do that if possible uh al hakam would you yeah. like to uh, please go ahead absolutely. absolutely well first of all uh it, it was such an immersive experience yes. uh, i believe for everyone even though who, even for those who aren't from aleppo or, or syria but for someone like me this triggered uh, past feelings that good feelings no trigger warnings uh, were uh, needed um i remembered uh Again, when I was nine and went with my father for the first time to that old house of, of ours, and he uh, the first task was literally to dust off the, the dust from uh, the floors of the, we call it al-Murabba, which is the, uh, the cubic room upstairs uh cube shaped uh, room upstairs and uh, it hadn't been dusted for 20 years it was classified as uh, ruins so entering this house and, and feeling like you've entered history and there are so many layers of that you've it 
is such a transformative thing. And seeing that really brings me back to that. And I really recommend, uh, I hope everybody who hasn't watched uh, Kevork's 15-minute uh, um, uh, piece work video uh, that's on Vimeo, uh, you'll find, and, and be patient with the first four or five minutes. It builds up towards a glorious end. Thank you, Kevork. Absolutely. It's uh, immersive. It's absolutely correct. And, and part of the, in, the experience of immersiveness in Kevork's work is that, in effect, he also uses poetry and music and visual imagery. He marries so many expressive uh, modalities, uh, and, which, which, again, uh, is so important uh, because a lot of the experience of living after war, destruction, etc., is loneliness. And part of what has the potential of it soothes some of it or repairs some of it is the together, is the immersive, is to create a, a, a sense of home, if not an actual home. Uh, uh, go ahead, Kev, or Q. Yeah, I was going to say, I want to uh, kind of end uh, my um, presentation with last uh, a piece, which is a, a video of an installation. Uh, this is called Tower of Babel. Oh, oh. <laughs> Tower of Babel, I think symbolically, it's just symbolically, it kind of also talks about this room, like you know, the three of us here, you know, I'm from a different background, and Lina, and Hakem, and uh, Dr. Yael. And somehow uh, it, it's for me important uh, to show this piece because I created about uh, diversity and you know different languages. Yeah, this is after yesterday he presented at the United Nations. So. Yes. So this was again. Go ahead. Go ahead, and then we open. Yeah. Go ahead. This was a commission by. Um, I don't know. Is it too messy? Are you guys seeing? It's open? perfect. It's perfect. Okay. So this one, um, I filmed it from inside. Uh, you're kind of uh, feeling that you're entering a, a chapel or, or kind of a temple, uh, but it's all made up. Uh, and to, I created this secret passage to go inside this tower uh, to be able to experience this temporary, temporary work that could go anywhere so you could take with you your own your own chapel and build your own spiritual space mm -hmm. so this is from inside and now i'm going to uh share with you from outside um this is no that was the outside you showed you didn't Share the inside before. Oh, you didn't share the inside. It looks right. from here. It's, it showed me that I'm sharing inside. Okay. This right. is this is the inside. Okay. Here we go. Exactly. Inside. Hmm? So what I did, uh, the key element here. Um, let me open the outside again because I was talking about inside while I was showing outside. Exactly. Just, so confusing. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, um, look like it's, this is it, correct? Now I'm showing the outside, correct? Yes. So here what I did, um, every window and door is cut. And through that, we see the writing. We see the calligraphy. So basically, it's the whisper, whisper of the ancestors through windows and doors. So when you come closer, you feel like you're, you're uh, kind of uh, great grandparents. They're, they're talking to you through those windows. So because every layer is divided in two, what's hidden behind the layer is only writing. What you see on the top is only the facade. So the structure. So when I created it, it's like a layer covers the other layer. When it covers, it covers only the writing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's... Uh... <laughs> As you see, I know his pieces by heart. <laughs> I love them too. Uh, Lena, anything you'd like to say right now before we open the floor to the audience? 
I just how wanted you, to how that. was your how was your daughter's presentation? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very good and it was a full house so I, I slipped in and slipped out so I really appreciate you for being so accommodating and for everybody here um, I have the background of Aleppo but I'm actually sitting in one of the administrators offices in the school uh, who kindly gave me her office to be able to do both things at once um, I just wanted to say that I mean I love Kivork's work and obviously I love Al Hakam's work in the Aleppo project, um, and I think that one if one of the takeaways from this event is to really for everybody who is not Syrian and not from Aleppo to really you know absorb this idea of how diverse um, people from Syria and people from Aleppo are and how the different viewpoints and how we connect so much so deeply on this cultural um, level and this love of our, the love of our country and this love of our city. Um, I don't know, I, I came in halfway through when Kivork was showing his images, but I don't know if he showed the image of the person pulling pulling the cart. Yes. And this is this is a piece that I always um, invoke in my talks. I always, a lot of talks I end with that image of Kivork's. Um, and I also recommend if anybody ever sees Home Within playing nearby you from Kivork and Kinan um, Azme, please see this, um, this event. It's an amazing performance. And so this image is also very relevant to what we're talking about in that we are all, we are all, Sir all Syrians around in the diaspora are carrying the pieces of their home and their pieces of their country with them. And they, we they take it wherever they go to rebuild something new that's affected by from wherever they are. So this is a concept that I we talk about a lot with the kids and the children and the students we work with who are refugees in that you hold your past, but you also are influenced and you have a responsibility to where you live in the present and in the future to be able to be contributing towards that society. And this is where this idea of welcoming refugees is so important is that it's a two way um, connection that the the act of welcoming is that the host community needs to welcome refugees, welcome immigrants, welcome new people into their communities, and invite them to contribute all of this potential, all of these things that you're seeing from Kivork, from Al Hakam, from me. It wouldn't happen unless we were able to take what we had and actually contribute to that society. But the society first has to be able to nurture and and embrace new people to be able to make that kind of vibrant um, dialogue dialogue between cultures to build something new, to build something that exists further past the, past the past and into a new future. Thank you. And, and we had an idea for you while you were listening to your daughter, which is to recruit some of the kids in, in your project to help Al Hakam's uh, digitalization work. Please. Please. So we already have future. <laughs> future yes, and and <laughs> many, many of the young kids want to become architects. So we have a lot of architects. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But there's something uh, about that in the chat uh, that I think is very important to learn here. Uh, um, the chat is so rich today, it's amazing. Uh, uh, let me just uh, can, can, it in the Q&A. Can I add one more thing before we jump in? Uh, uh, yes, of course. I just realized, uh, Lena, do you remember this piece? Uh, I made this for, for you because many years ago you asked me to create a piece about Aleppo and uh, we did this uh, fundraising. So yes. and at the same time, I shared this with a wonderful friend of mine, Karim Rustom, and he put uh, Aleppo songs in this. So this book is for solo piano. I'm going to put the link here uh, for solo piano, uh, but it's Aleppo songs. It's there in the chat. So, um, so let, me, let me read some of, let me attend to the audience, which I'm sure you want me to do. Uh, and there is a very interesting comment by Robin, who says, my interest in learning more about Aleppo started from reading that the Egyptian hijacker Mohammed Atta was an architecture student of Aleppo. Quotes for his thesis, Atta concentrated on the uh, ancient Syrian city of Aleppo. 
he researched the history of the urban landscape in relation to the general theme of conflict between Arab and modern civilization. He traveled there several times. If only he could have continued those studies instead of contributing to the destruction of another city, New York City an act that led over the years to the destruction of the city he loved. Thank you, Robin, for making this connection. Uh, we can have a whole seminar just on that. Yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, and a couple very of words. quickly, Lena, because we have other important contacts. Go ahead, Lena. You are the architect, go ahead. And just to, just to um to in response to this in that this becomes like a very political space of a response in that where does extremism come from and mm -hmm. we can argue that extremism really does come from the fact when people are not given enough space to actually have these kinds of nurturing and rich discussions so specifically so this context is like you know the 9-11 context and um and in the context of the Syrian war um one of the most important things that we can do for young people who are Syrian refugees that's often forgotten in the humanitarian response is how do you actually help people reach, like we said before, their full potential, their full dignity, so that they can be able to contribute to society when they are actually, those points are like taken away from them. We create this vacuum that we've actually seen in Syria, what the vacuum actually creates in terms of extremism and violence from different, um, different factions and different sides. And so I think that the most like art and culture and freedom of thought and freedom, uh, like at freedom to to express yourself is actually the biggest antidote to anything of these kinds of like acts of violence and extremism. And this is where we actually continue need, we continuously need to create our humanitarian responses to have that space for creativity and innovation and dignity that's often lacking in the humanitarian response. Uh, thank you. Very as wise as always. <laughs> thank you, Lena. Can, can I add one more thing before we we jump? That's okay. Uh, uh, yes, but I want to have an, an opportunity for everybody in the yeah. audience also to speak. Second. <laughs> uh, based on what Lena was was saying right now, it remind me of one amazing experience that I had at uh, uh, Al Azraq camp in 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 uh, Jordan. I went there with the Silk Road Ensemble. We showed the music of strangers there. And after that, we did a little workshop with uh, kids. They were probably between eight and 12. And I remember this one kid, he kept his sketchbook after the workshop and he stayed there until last minute. And I was mesmerized. He had this incredible haunting eyes and, and full of kind of uh, emotions. And I said, what's wrong? He said, when I grow up, I want to be like you. So I think the moment that we can, we can plant the hope in children to become better, we give them the hope. As, as Lina said, you know, extremism, they kind of give them this, this box view of what to do in the future. But us, if we could kind of give them as much as possible to become more free to express their freedom. We won't see extremism. We won't see this, this catastrophe that people label, label them as extremists. Anyway, just that, thank you. Yes, we can, as I said, each comment from the audience today actually is worth another webinar or another whole week seminar. Uh, so let's take it that way uh, because there's so much wisdom. Um, I, 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 I want to add another love gift here that I received from Madeline Miller. Uh, uh, Madeline, um, Robbie, can you put Madeline on? Yes, I'll see if she joins. One second. Okay, because when when Madeline received the announcement of this webinar, she brought me this gift of soap from Aleppo. Oh, now I see. So now, so Madeline, would you please tell the story? Because here we go, another creative act of Aleppo and refugees. Uh, Madeline, please tell the story. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. First, to each of you, very moving presentations. I'm 
deeply moved by how personal each of you reflected um, and Kevork, your work is magnificent. Thank you. Um, as soon as the war became a part of our awareness, I was so struck by the fact that my very favorite soap was from Aleppo. And I was wondering <laughs> what would happen, what would be the case of finding my soap, which of course is <laughs> made of olive oil and laurel oil um, and uh, so deeply revered. Um, and I went online and I found Aleppo soap being made in Turkey. And I was concerned, what does that mean? Are others taking this for, for their own soap? Is it um, really Aleppo soap? And I did some looking into it and, and saw a story of two cousins whose family had uh, been involved in the artistry of making soap over many, many generations who were deeply interested in preserving the continuity of their family's history, the, the tradition of making this beautiful soap. And they did find space in Turkey. Um, they found the community of workshops, which were now gone, so they could use the, the space, the specialized space for the very intricate process of making that soap. Um, and uh, it was very heartening to me. And it was only one of so many stories of artisans moving to Turkey, finding right near the Syrian border, finding the climate similar, um, able to use um, their traditional ways instead of more modern ways, uh, being committed to preserving that tradition. And very sadly, I wondered about the earthquake. And of course, I had found that these um, particular cousins had their workshop, their soap workshop in, um, I hope I am pronouncing it. It's okay, Madeline, but please, uh, if you speak a little faster. Yes, so just very quickly. Understand. Yes, very quickly. Gaziantep may be the name. I may pronounce it wrong. Um, and sadly... And put, um, it, put it in the chat, please. Yes, I will. Um, and sadly, of course, the earthquake has devastated, if not that exact area, um, the surrounding areas. I know many people came to that uh, city uh, to find shelter and to look for food, etc. So I think of their traveling to create a safe space and to continue their work across the generations and now having uh, a sad uh, outcome and hopefully it will continue and they will find safety if not there somewhere close by. Um, so yes, I'm shortening a very interesting story um, and meaningful for yeah, me. Yeah, thank you so much dear and thanks for the gift. I will. Yes. I can I give you one? I'll give you a piece of it. <laughs> yes, yes, please. I grew up okay, one. No, I, will give I, you a piece of I grew soap. up. It was the only soap we used to use at home. My mom <laughs> used to get anything else besides Aleppo soap. So it's a well, home. I will share it with you. Every and, time and I practice my body, I transform to Aleppo. <laughs> and then there's a, an amazing comment from Jackie uh, from Canada. Thank you for your sacred presentations. I'm indigenous from Canada and had our painful experiences from the Canadian policies referred to as Indian Act, which had power over our homes by taking children away from away from their homes, family, culture, land, etc., to residential schools where abuse was rampant. 
we are working on locating now our missing children who never came home by searching through archives and cross-referencing with survivor testimonies. You have given me hope to move forward in how to design recovery project. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie, please write to uh, you, write an email to us because we had last year two amazing webinars on, uh, on the indigenous schools, both about the history and about the attempts across uh, North America um, and actually and, and New Zealand uh, about those. So please review those webinars in our, in our website and write to us so we can continue or add you to the working group as well of people who are, who are doing it. Uh, 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 there's a gracias for such an amazing dialogue from Spain uh, with our Syrian friends in the diaspora in Galicia, uh, or Galicia. Uh, also connected to people from Aleppo in Rome and Berlin. Mutual support giving us all hope despite the painful memories and present challenges. It sounds like we have to continue this. Uh, and there, there was a, there was another comment that very important that I wanted to share, uh, more of a theoretical conceptual one that I totally agree with. Um, uh, Craig, who always also always follows us, which is wonderful, Craig, thank you. He, he writes that Pauline Boss coined the term ambiguous loss sounds magical, to describe a relationship with a person who is, quote, there but not there, to describe the contradictory and complicated feeling of some kinds of loss. I'd love to hear any thoughts from the panelists on the idea of ambiguous loss of home. Is that an idea that resonates with you? Absolutely. Let me hold off on inviting the panelists to write about. And, and, and Craig, thank you for the idea. If you know Pauline's uh, contacts, that would be wonderful because I think we should have a special webinar exactly on that. Okay, so before I, I open it to the panelists uh, the, uh, and people comment about how they resonate with most of what you were talking about, there was a Q&A. Uh, there were questions very specific to you. Uh, uh, one question, I have a question for all panelists. This is from Basant Elbana. How has the work you are doing for Aleppo and Syria, Syrians, help or not? You cope with your personal loss. Okay, so I want you to hold that question in your mind. And, the, and Omar Salem is asking you, Lena in particular, if you get to visit Aleppo soon, what would be the first thing you will do? <laughs> so maybe Lena, you can answer first and then we can talk about how your work helps you heal. And I want to underline my concept of identity healing uh, to the discussion. Uh, I think that Lena and I will continue to talk about that. And um, Lena, please answer your question and then... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll answer my question quickly and hand it off because I'd love to hear Hak Al Hakam and um, Kivork's answers. And I I'm very, very taken by this idea of ambiguous loss. I'll need to think about that more. Um, and um, so, what I would do if I went, if I went, uh, thank you, Ahmad, for your question. If I um, and my, I wanted to say that my parents are both on this webinar. So hi. Oh, wonderful. And and they have a whole attachment to. 
Aleppo soap and they can give you a lot of they can they can do a whole webinar on Aleppo soaps if you want. Oh. Um, they, have, they, still, they still have an, a, a soap dealer that gets them their soaps all the way here from Chicago and they have a lot of um, very important opinions on the, the the percentages of the laurel and the olive oil and, <laughs> and but if I went back if I was able to magically go to Aleppo I think I would I'm very I would be inspired by um, Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love. And so I would definitely eat first. <laughs> and I would go to, because you can never find any food in the world better than food from Aleppo. So I would eat first. I would walk in the um, from the Sabil to the old city because I would be able to get all of my memories. And I would want to go to the top of the citadel to look at the entire city again. And um, to pray, I would want to go to Madras al Firdos, which is one of my favorite buildings in Aleppo, actually in the world. It's a perfect um, example of um, Islamic architecture. And it's a beautiful, sacred building that is very close by to where my um, great grandparents and a lot of our ancestors are buried. And so I would pray there and visit that cemetery and to um, see, you know, be have that spiritual connection to my roots. Thank you, Lena and Kevor. You, you look ready to speak. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about something to do, but that place doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. One of my favorite things I used to do when I used to go back from the art school in Armenia to Aleppo I used to go to the the, the Abu Abdul Fawal, is the full the this incredible. It's like almost like a, a a time capsule of ancient Aleppo, where you enter this old place and they serve you these fava beans, and masterfully done because generation after generation they mastered that. So that was for me a place I used to go and enjoy the true flavor of Aleppo because going from the the middle class neighborhood of Aleppo and Midan to that area, kind of moving almost like through passage of time. So visually it was striking for me to enter that Salibiye and all that to enter, arrive to that place. Unfortunately, his place is destroyed during uh, the war and uh, the I passed. Sorry? I think I think it's been rebuilt. I mean, it won't be the same, never the same, but I think they've, they've rebuilt it, the family. Yeah, but let me tell you positive side of the, the, the that that act. I I dying to know what happened to it. They told me his son opened the branch in Egypt, and he is so successful because he took flavor of Aleppo with him there. So the same thing is happening in Armenia. So many of the restaurants went from Aleppo to to Armenia. They opened branches there, and they're doing so well. So Aleppo has so much to offer to the world regardless if you're an artist or a historian or humanitarian. I feel like we're so blessed by so many things that we learned from Aleppo. And I'm so fortunate that to, to answer to one of the attendees that when I create work about Aleppo, I feel like I'm reliving the memory and that keeps me alive. Keeps me alive to share with the world something that I felt so blessed to experience if I did not create, if I don't create things about my city, my home, I feel like, why am I being an artist? I'm gonna be like the, the, the next Jackson Pollock or the, the next Western artist? No, I'm just going to be the artist who can build those memories to share it with the audience who never experienced that. And, and if I may, uh, in my own theory, uh, that was originally called Trauma and the continuity of self. A multidisciplinary, multidimensional framework. Trauma is a rupture of all kinds of systems of life, depending which in the nature of whatever trauma. Anything we do to resurrect the continuity right, to rebuild a sense of belongingness, et cetera, et cetera, we, can, we will continue that, is healing, right? It counteracts the rupture. And the importance of creativity here is when we heal a scar, we don't want the scar to remain very hard, right? Because if the scar remains hard, it's exactly what Lena said before, you're stuck. You can't 
any more be flexible about that part. So even though it's very painful, and it may be even, it's a long process, an intergenerational process, we want to maintain even the scar as more flexible, as more, more uh, to soothe the scar. So it does not keep us only in the past that we lost, which is related to the concept that you brought about, you know, that Pauline came up with. I would love to meet her and to do something together on that. So uh, clearly, and that's part of what I call identity healing, because all of the distraction we are talking about, particularly the man-made disaster, is about identity, right? People are attacked because of who they are. And we don't want them to only think of themselves and their succeeding generation as only that, that they were attacked for who they were. But that's why we have the different adaptational styles. So there's so much more to talk about. And this webinar is so full of wisdom. And we will continue. Another thing I want to talk about that we must do for the future, again, uh, of course, because of the situation of Ukraine, part of the webinars we do along that continuum we plan to do is about the refugees, right, all over. Uh, and uh, I, I suggest that after we do the specific one, we also do interpopulation one, so we can lean at, we can learn from each other, right? What works, what doesn't work for refugees, because we have billion, we have so many refugees today. I mean, they can fit countries, and and so that is a total, a total. Uh, obligation for us to continue with. And Lena, you would probably become the co-chair of the refugee working group of the center. Start thinking. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me just go ahead. We need Al Hakam to answer the question too. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> thank, right, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. No, I, I, I love listening, hearing your, your plans. Uh, and, and this was the question on what I would do if I... Uh, the first thing you do, yeah. Yeah, uh, sleep in my bed, lie in my bed. Uh, I would wow. uh, want to dust it off uh, again. Uh, and I tried in 2014, two years after I actually left, uh, I was uh, working in Turkey and I had one long weekend and uh, uh, I had too much hope that I thought um, things will settle down. I can go one day, but I caught myself two years in feeling, oh, my God, if I don't go back to Aleppo and visit now when it's possible, it was possible to cross the border from Turkey to rebel held Aleppo and uh, go directly to old Aleppo where our home was without going through regime checkpoints. And uh, uh, and I needed to take opportunity of that. Unfortunately, I only managed to stay one night because every time I tried to go, uh, when I had longer days off, uh, the roads would be targeted with heat-seeking missiles, the Castello Road and all the roads op uh, uh, leading out of Aleppo and into it. And that window opportunity I, I had, I, I managed to stay one night, but I, I don't know why I was so naive that I listened to my neighbor uh, who told me, the ones whose homes now were destroyed in Antakya, uh, who told me, Hakam, look, it's too dusty. Like you'll spend two, three hours. You're only here one day. Come stay in our place. Don't, don't worry about it. And I, I regret it so much. I just wanted to sleep in my bed. That's why I went. I, you know, and it's still there. Half of our house is gone. The kitchen beds and a bit of the living room. My, my <laughs> bedroom is still there. I want to go there and do that. Hopefully one day. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. And one other thing I'm thinking about, Lena, for a, a question that I would like to either speak about today or next time, uh, is 
under parents involved in Karam also, because we are talking, right? One thing is that Karam gives it home to the kids, but even in one, you said everything. Uh, how, are the parents connected to this? Who is taking, are the parents also getting care? Yes, absolutely. So that's a really important point is that the Karam houses are commun community centers. So they're not actually places where people live. They come there after school and on the weekends and during the day if you're not um, in school. And so it primarily functions as a place for teenagers do innovation programming at Karam House. So it's a design based learning program, very high tech, you know, the opposite of what you would think that's that would be available to vulnerable populations, but this is our approach is that we actually reverse the model of aid and actually give people everything that they need. And so the kids have access to maker spaces, 3D printers, laser cutters, Wi-Fi, mentors, all, libraries, all these kinds of things. But there is definitely, there we have a program that's specifically for families and that we nurture, and most of them are female-led households, but we do have some that have both parents. And so we have, we offer financial assistance to vulnerable families and um and and we basically in con on condition that they send their children to school and we try to get these families on the pathway to self-sufficiency through um, getting them connected to job job training and vocational training so that they're able to provide for themselves and their families but we always make education as like the core piece of all of our aid in that so that everything is attached to that you know you have to even now in the earthquake you have to help people now there's an urgency people need food water blankets heat shelter but we also want to as quickly as possible build in that continuity that you brought up actually i wrote this down i didn't even think about it in terms of continuity for trauma but the continuity of life because the minute that even now with this earthquake when kids are out of school for longer periods of time then they are it's very quickly they're they they could get it's lost part of, into it's part of the trauma Exactly. So how do you get people back into school, back into work, back into any sense of normalcy so that they can build lives? And that's what we're always trying to do. Unfortunately, between the war and, and natural disasters, you think life gets disrupted in such a, or the pandemic, that life gets disrupted, di disrupted in such a, an extreme way that affects refugee populations. Um, in a much more m m deeper way than if, for instance, an earthquake happened somewhere else, it's always a tragedy. But this earthquake happening in a war-torn area that's filled with millions of displaced people, that's why this earthquake actually has a double effect of a disaster. Absolutely. It, it, the double is actually rather generous. I think there were so many other. I agree. Uh, it's hard to, to, to end this important process uh so we will we will commit to continuing and how come you you can also come up with an idea for a working group to revive languages or some i'm sure it's connected and, and, and the connection between language and life because we have you have all of the re related professions and i then healing identity right so uh, before we close, I want to invite everyone to our next webinar, uh, which will take place on Wednesday, March 29 at one o'clock. That seems to be the good hour for international participation. Uh, and it will be on Indigenous artists, visual artists of the Americas. So we have an artist, indigenous artist, women artist from Canada, indigenous men artist from Navajo, indigenous uh, <laughs> Mexican artist <laughs> from Mexico, and a, a beautiful uh, indigenous visual artist from Brazil. Uh, and, uh, and interestingly enough, connected to this, they also speak about the meaning of their art. And 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 it, it, it also is activism.
So uh, please, I love you. Come so we continue the conversation. And what always worries me is that Aleppo will only bring Aleppo interested people. Indigenous, only indigenous. I want to create an ongoing learning and together dialogue with all. Not just dialogue, but many logs, many conversations. So we learn and listen, listen and, and help each other. Because as you see, uh, what you presented today resonated not only with Syrians, but so many others. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Yael. <laughs> thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak about our home. Yes, thank you so much. It was really a great pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yael. Thank you.